Hello and welcome to the Auto Buyer's Guide podcast powered by Alex on Autos. I'm Tim, he's Alex. The cast starts now. Alex, the Dodge Hornet. Let me know your initial impressions. This is just breaking. We've had the name around forever. Now we have a name, a face, and a spec sheet. Yep. And uh, I was surprised they went with Hornet because Hornet's never been a Chrysler family name. Uh, I actually was a little bit confused about this because my dad had a Hornet and my mom hated it. And my mom always called it a Dodge Hornet. So for some reason, that's what stuck in my mind. And I always assumed it was somehow. Looked it up. It was an AMC Hornet. It was actually predated uh, predated the Chrysler acquisition of AMC by quite a long way. So it was very far removed from any of the Chrysler days. So who knows why they dug this one up, except for the fact that they could have a cool logo with a little stinger on it. And, you know, that's actually is kind of cool, a little logo they chose for the, uh, the Hornet. This is basically an Alfa Romeo Tonali, which is a distant cousin to the Cherokee and the compass. A lot of folks have been confused about this because one would call it a new platform, really. The relationship between the compass and Cherokee is tenuous at best, and it mainly relates to a few crash structure components. None of the infotainment electronics, the electrical systems, the uh, uh, floor pan, etc. none of that is shared with Cherokee or with compass, and the dimensions are pretty different. In the US, this is gonna be somewhere between those two Jeep products in terms of size. They're calling it a compact crossover, but it's on the small side for the contact segment. It's a little bit smaller than a RAV4, but definitely bigger than you know Hyundai Kona, something along those lines. Very much like the Alfa Romeo Tonali, it's gonna be turbocharged standard in America, plug-in hybrid optional, interestingly built in Italy, so it's not gonna qualify for the new federal tax credits on that plug-in hybrid model. But Dodge is being pretty aggressive on pricing. They're saying it's gonna start under $30,000 with over 260 horsepower standard and standard all wheel drive. It is kind of interesting that they're going straight for the, I guess the performance end of the spectrum when there's also gonna be an Alfa Romeo that presumably is shooting for the same kind mm -hmm. of customer. Now I've seen some of the overlays of interior layouts. Yes, the Dodge version is a little bit more Motown, but fundamentally they're the same. And the powertrains are interesting because they both go for the guy maybe who dreams of a Hellcat but has to buy this because he's got a young family. Yep. Yeah, 265 horsepower in the standard version. And then what's really interesting is that along the lines of the RAV4 Prime, which is going to be a class competitor, the hybrid setup is more performance focused than efficiency focused. Yes, and oddly, both powertrains will produce more power in the Dodge than in the Alpha. And that's a weird twist because most companies that have a luxury arm and a mainstream arm that share technologies, usually the luxury one is the more powerful option. And here it's going to be the opposite. You will need to feed it premium gasoline, however, to get that maximum power output. The plug-in hybrid system is going to give you theoretically 30 miles of range, about six seconds, zero to 60 from a 1.3 liter turbocharged engine and approximately a 15 and a half kilowatt hour battery pack. It should charge in about two to two and a half hours or so. I'm really intrigued by that model and I'm intrigued to see if they decide to move production to North America because for this segment, the tax credit is probably really important. The Toyota RAV4 Prime, it's not gonna get the tax credit because it's built in Japan. This one won't either, but if they could somehow move production to North America, this would be in a segment where that tax credit could be pretty important. Yeah, that's definitely something to think about going forward because right out of the gate, and we'll talk about this a little bit more later, there's a relatively small list of cars that immediately meet the criteria for the new a tax credit which is expanded but also a lot more selective now for those of you out in cyberspace the standard version of the hornet's going to come with at least and these are keywords here at least 265 horsepower mm -hmm. 295 pound feet of torque now there is a plug-in hybrid as alex mentioned with a 15.5 kilowatt hour battery that will give a useful plug-in range but you're also going to get at least again those words 285 <laughs> horsepower 383 pound feet of torque and aside from where it might be built ultimately, it's definitely coming out of Italy to start. There will be a feature out of the gate that seems very American, and that is a sort of boost 
function. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about power shot and what that might mean? Yes, there are a few details that are sketchy. So it appears, but they haven't been overly specific, that the boost mode is going to make it go 0 to 60 in that six second number. Although there is some flexibility in the way they've constructed the wording on their press release that might indicate it would be a little bit faster than that when that boost mode is enabled. But it's pretty similar to what we find in, say, a Genesis GV60, etc. It's going to give you just a little bit more oomph out of the motors. What is also intriguing about the system is that it's going to have a pretty powerful motor in the back, 121 horsepower in the rear. So more power on the rear axle than we find in a RAV4 hybrid, uh, about 20% more power on the back. Then on the front, it's going to have a six-speed automatic transmission. Details there completely unknown. We don't know whether it's the dual clutch transmission that we find in the European market Alpha Tonali, or whether it's going to be a traditional automatic transmission. And Dodge has not answered any of the press's questions on this particular front. But in terms of construction, this hybrid system sounds suspiciously similar to the hybrid systems that we're starting to see in a lot of luxury car companies. Volvo has been using a, a system of a very similar design for about uh, 10 years now or so with a regular automatic up front, motor in the back, and a turbocharged engine. Now Toyota is finally jumping on board and they're going to be having a very similar system in the Crown and the Lexus RX and perhaps some other models coming up soon. And now Stellantis is jumping in with a, a system of a very similar design. Yeah, and pursuant to what we've seen from a couple other brands and models recently, if you can overdrive rear wheels, you can create the impression of a rear drive biased chassis balance, even in the vehicle that is fundamentally front wheel drive. And because there is going to be a performance emphasis here, uh, keep in mind, they're going to make summer performance tires available. They're claiming a 0.9 G lateral skid pad holding. Yeah, they're uh, claiming it's best in class handling is a pretty, pretty aggressive claim. That and Brembo brakes being advertised right out of the gate on a compact crossover, which traditionally is not the their red-blooded, yeah. heart-pounding uh, product category. And uh, not this, just Brembo front brakes like we find on some Cadillac crossovers. It's yeah. going to have Brembos in the back, too. Okay, You see, that is, like, dirty secret <laughs> in the industry. A lot of times when you get that Brembo brake car, it is just the front calipers. That's a good point right there. And I guess pricing is the question, then. Like, how do you price this thing so it's both accessible uh, and, and exciting? I think it's difficult. Those yeah. are always odds. That is tricky. So it's going to start under $30,000 again with all wheel drive and the two liter turbo. The plug in hybrid, the rumor mill is saying based on what what uh, what uh, Dodge has said so far, it's going to be a little over $40,000, I believe was the price point bandied around. But I suspect they were assuming it would qualify for the tax credit when these numbers were hatched on the plug in hybrid. If it had a $7,500 tax credit, that would have been epic. It won't, though. So that could make it a little bit pricey for the segment. Same thing goes, though, honestly, for the RAV4 Prime uh, and any of the other more expensive plug-in hybrids in the compact crossover segment. Worth noting, though, that going forward, the only plug-in hybrids in this segment that will have the tax credit will be from Ford. Also important to note, because I mean, frankly, ETAs are everything these days. Um, as a coming attraction, you can wait for maybe a trickle of details. Uh, have they given us any hard dates on the calendar? Like when will no pricing? When will have a build sheet? When a configurator will go online mm -hmm. on the website? Like, is there any kind of schedule of release? No details on the configurator, but you can order through a dealer today, which is a little bit unusual since we don't have too many details. They are going to start production very shortly. We should drive them before the end of the year, and then they will actually be arriving on dealer lots sometime in early 2022, uh, sorry, early 2023, with the plug-in hybrid model coming, quote unquote, shortly after, probably around spring. And remember, there will be additional ways you can dress this up, both cosmetically and in a performance sense. There's going to be a track pack. Uh, which is going to be exciting 20 inch wheels mm -hmm. or performance tires again you've got those brembos front and back and they're also talking about adjustable dampers not magna ride not magneto rheological right. but two two different steps with i guess a variable valving uh the way adjustable shocks used to be before magna yes. ride. i'm this. really intrigued to see what this track pack turns out to be because they haven't given us too many details and that model already has the brembo brake standard 
I was really shocked to see that the track pack was there because there were a lot of rumors swirling around exactly what the Hornet would be. Some rumors said maybe it would be a different alpha platform and that it would be rear wheel drive, which is what I had personally hoped for. But when they said it was going to be the front wheel drive vehicle, I thought, oh, well, you know, cross that off the list. It's going to be a little boring. And then Dodge pours out all these quirky details like a track pack on a compact mainstream crossover, which seems bonkers. Um, so I, I want to know exactly what it includes. It just says it ha will have additional performance upgrades with no commentary on what those are. There's also talk about having like Mopar performance parts available out of the gate for dealer installation without voiding the warranty. So mm -hmm. if you guys can remember the old Dodge SRT4, the Turbo Neon, that had some wild stage one, stage two kits you could have installed at the point of purchase without voiding the warranty. Uh, I would not bet against the idea that this GLH concept that is coming based on the Hornet might uh, give birth to quite a few parts that you can basically just add as dealer installed accessories at the point of purchase. And maybe that's where you get down to RAV4 Prime-like levels of mm -hmm. performance. Yeah, lots unknown here. We also don't know what's next for Dodge because they've got a pretty aging lineup. And we know that now the Durango is going to live on yet another year and the Charger and Challenger yet another year as well. There is the promise of a future full electric vehicle coming soon by the time that you're watching this video uh, or podcast, whichever way you're watching it. We will know more of those details, but essentially they're calling it a Banshee electric vehicle platform. And the Challenger appears to be discontinued from what we've seen so far. The Charger is going to now be the two-door performance vehicle, at least as far as the concepts they're showing. No production dates on any of that. So until then, the existing lineup is probably just going to cling on for dear life. Yeah, well, two-door Charger, I think the purists are probably going to celebrate that one. Two-door Charger that's electric, I think they're going to be conflicted. All right, speaking of electric. It will have a, a exhaust note, however, which is bonkers. So 125 decibels out the back of the vehicle. They're claiming it will be the first electric vehicle with an exhaust. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm going to use like, now, those of you listening, these are like my parentheticals, exhaust. Yes, it's, quote unquote exhaust, yes. Yeah. Uh, I am intrigued to see what, sh what sound it plays, especially with a drivetrain that they're calling Banshee. It will be an 800 volt system though, which is uh, interesting. I'm going to just go ahead and opine. I know we're, we don't do a whole lot of editorial here, but I'm not down with that. I don't want my gas powered V8 to sound like a horse. And I'm not sure I want my electric car to sound like a V8. Like there's a, a purity of, I don't know, essence there thing that's being compromised. They're, uh, yeah, they're not saying it's going to sound like a gasoline engine. They're saying it's going to have a unique electric vehicle sound. Uh, what that is, I don't know. But since it is electric, you could unplug it. Yeah, well, I mean, maybe they're just going to like jump a generation of transportation and the electric car will sound like the horse. There you go. And you know with a, a some sort of megaphone-like thing in the back of your electric car connected to electronics capable of doing 125 decibels out the back, which they're saying is as loud as a Hellcat under full throttle acceleration, you know that's going to get hacked and it's going to be used to play a wide variety of sounds. If anybody gets one of these, if it makes it to production and you get one of these, I will have a prize if you somehow hack your car and have it play the Alex and Auto's intro jingle. There you go. The gauntlet has been thrown down. Remember when Dunlop would give you free tires if you got a Dunlop tattoo on your arm? Well, you it's the, the gauntlet has been thrown, the line in the sand. Um, okay, electric cars. You've had quite a few in your fleet recently. An interesting one, BMW iX. Lots of good things to say. A real breakthrough in efficiency from a company that's not Lucid or Tesla as well. Yes, the BMW's new electronic drive systems have been excellent in terms of efficiency. Uh, we should say that it's not limited just to the iX. The i4 benefits from this as well. And all the other new uh, BMW EVs that are coming soon are going to use the same relative suite of technologies. BMW has decided to go a little bit old school and use motors with brushes, but not DC motors with brushes. These are AC motors with brushes, and they're using them in a very specific way. You see, up till this point, all electric vehicles sold in the United States uh, in recent memory have used either induction motors, which is what Tesla used for quite some time, or permanent magnet rare earth motors, which is what the vast majority of EV manufacturers use. 
There are pros and cons to both of these designs. The big benefit to an induction motor is cost. It doesn't use any rare earth materials. Rare earth magnet motors tend to be the most efficient motors currently used right now. They also have some slight benefits when it comes to regen braking, things like that. But supposedly the rare earth magnet motors don't do as well when we're talking about coasting and turning the motor off. So if you're trying to have a dual motor vehicle, uh, this is why some Teslas have used one permanent magnet motor and one induction motor. You can just disconnect the induction motor and the losses are a little bit lower there. But with BMW, what they're doing is they have some ring-like contacts. Rather than typical brushes, which are just single contact points on a rotating part, they actually have these ring contacts that are energizing the stator in the motor. And those allow them to change the magnetic field characteristics. In an induction motor, you don't really have control over it. It's just, uh, be, it's induced by the windings on the motor and it will change based on what you're doing to the windings. On a rare earth motor, it's stationary, it cannot change. But what BMW can do is they can change the characteristics of it. They can also de-energize the coils if they want to improve efficiency. So for instance, in steady state highway travel, that sort of thing, they can just use one motor if they wanted to. And then it also allows them to deliver more power from that same motor. Now, I know there have been some concerns about brush life, but BMW says they should last about 200,000 miles. Okay, that's fair. I think that's one of the great challenges when people hear that brushed technology is being used. A lot of folks think of that as sort of a 20th century kind of technology. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, brushed electric motors, the kind of the original design, there's a lot of arcing, there's a lot of contact, there's metal on metal. But if BMW is put in the time, I, I trust that they've figured out they can put a warranty on this, sell an extended mm -hmm. warranty, sell an extended warranty on top of that. I'm sure they've done their homework. Yeah, the, the interesting part about here is, is sort of how they're being used. So one of the benefits to a, a an AC brushed motor in this particular use case is that they're not really running a lot of current through the brushes. Okay. So that means that the, the likelihood of arcing is a lot lower. It's also AC rather than DC. Arcing potential is generally speaking higher with DC. And most of us are more familiar with brushed DC motors. Those are the kinds of, of motors that you find in a lot of small toys, et cetera, that are smoking and making that arcing smell. Yes. I mean, that's that's an important point too. And I think it's, uh, it's, it's interesting to me that this is part of a whole system engineering that's produced unexpected levels of efficiency. You took the mm -hmm. IX out, you tested it between, I think you had it somewhere between three miles per kilowatt hour and like yeah. three and a half miles per kilowatt hour. And I remember people, people used to say Tesla had three great strengths. They had three moats against the rest of the industry. They had brand recognition, they had the superchargers, and then they had system engineering, efficiency from top to bottom, every part designed to work in concert. So these first generation electric products from European companies like the Mercedes, you know, EQC, the Audi e-tron, the Jaguar I-Pace, mm -hmm. none of them came anywhere near Tesla efficiency, even when they had a comparably sized battery, that seems different with the iX. And yes, the and when we take a look at other competitors like the EV6, the eGMP platform vehicles entirely from Hyundai, Kia, Genesis, etc., they are very, very similar to very uh, to comparably sized and comparably performing Teslas when it comes to efficiency. So there really is is relatively little efficiency benefit uh, on the Tesla side, and. It, depending on exactly what you're doing with your EV, there may actually be some benefits from the traditional auto companies as well. For right now, uh, for instance, we're testing Vampire Drain on the Rivian versus the Lightning at the moment. Decided to toss in the Kia EV6 here. And you're starting to see in these situations where maybe you're leaving your car parked for a long amount of time, or perhaps you're concerned not necessarily about driving efficiency and driving range, but just how much energy your vehicle is using period, then it is kind of a different construct when we talk about Tesla and Rivian specifically. Tesla and Rivian both went down the same road of, of trying to integrate as much as possible. So we have just a very limited number of processing units in the vehicle. And the expectation is those processing units are doing everything for the car from integrating with the keys, your Bluetooth device, the cell modem, locking and unlocking the vehicle, et cetera, keeping all that running and infotainment, everything jammed into this one computer. Whereas say a Ford Lightning or a Mach-E or an EV6, they use more discrete systems. So they use the same sort of door lock interface modules as a regular ICE vehicle. They have the same sort of internet connectivity modules as a regular ICE vehicle. 
And on a gasoline or diesel vehicle where you have a 12 volt battery, that battery is teeny tiny compared to an EV. So energy consumption and efficiency when idle is extraordinarily important. I just went away for two weeks, just a little under two weeks. During that two week time, the Ford F-150 Lightning consumed about two kilowatt hours of energy, not a lot. It was actually little enough that the gauge was still saying 100% battery, even though it was probably about 99%. The range had dropped about five miles. The Kia EV6, it lost 3% of its battery, but when you actually calculate that out, because the battery is so much smaller, it consumed a little bit less than the Lightning, still pretty close together, about one and a half kilowatt hours. The Rivian consumed 33 kilowatt hours over that two week period. It lost about 30% of its battery over that time. And this is actually not unusual because uh, you know, there's some Tesla models out there. Tesla's official energy consumption figures for most of their vehicles is between one and 2% per day loss without sentry mode. And you should know that on the Rivian, the gear guard uh, mode, which is very much like their sentry mode, that was disabled. So this um, is another facet of efficiency. I just want to throw exactly, out that you're exactly. in California. This is not yes. preventing the battery from freezing in the tundra. That's another right. energy expense. This is just yep. idling in a temperate climate. Now, on the Rivian side, there is some of the some battery conditioning going on here because what we noticed, we decided to rerun this test because there was a software update right in the middle of our two week test. Rivian released a software update in the release notes. It says it reduces consumption when idle by 15%. So I said, great, now we have to redo the whole test again. So we're in the process of doing that. And we've noticed that the loss is relatively similar, unfortunately. But I think that's because during the day, we've noticed if people are out and about in the parking lot here, because it's parked at the office, that the Rivian will occasionally have its fan on to cool the battery. And it's not that hot. They're just being crazy conservative. The maximum temperature outdoors over the last week has been 85. So we're not in Phoenix. Um, and the Rivian still felt the need to, to you know, cool the battery down. The Lightning and the EV6 did not. Now, this is all quite fascinating to me because I think a lot of people assume that with electric cars, they're like gas powered cars, that they're not using energy when they're not moving or at the mm -hmm. very least when they're not on. But when they're on the road, there's also a difference between range and efficiency. And a lot of people confuse this because we mostly yes. think of electric cars in terms of range. Uh, but if you look at some vehicles like the Hummer, the Ford F-150, the Rivian, they have very big batteries and very low efficiency. The 500 mile Lucid Air Dream doesn't have that big a battery for the range it's given, nor does the BMW mm -hmm. iX or the i4. So talk a little bit about the difference between range and efficiency. Yeah, the first thing we should talk about is the way that EPA range numbers are done. This is something of a, a learning moment, I think, for people as they move into the EV world. We're very used to looking at fuel economy figures in the combined sense on a gasoline vehicle or a diesel vehicle, and then going, oh, well, you know, I beat that 25 miles per gallon my vehicle is rated for on my road trip to wherever. And that's because the highway fuel economy numbers are usually higher than the combined number on a gasoline diesel vehicle. It is very, very unusual, and it really just the purview of hybrids, for the highway fuel economy to be lower than the city fuel economy number on a gasoline vehicle sold here. But when it comes to electric vehicles, that is not the case. Typically, the city number is the high number and the highway number is the lower number. So for instance, if we take a look at an F-150 Lightning, 320 miles of combined range. But if you take a look at the EPA highway number for a Lightning, it's just about 280 miles of range. So pretty significant difference there. And if you look at EVs that are crossovers or SUVs or truck-like things shape-wise, those generally fall into that window. On the other hand, if we're looking at very sleek, very low profile vehicles like a Porsche Taycan or the Lucids, then the highway number may actually be slightly higher because of the greater aerodynamic efficiency. And that's why the Lucid gets such excellent range. About 500 miles of range, there is still a little bit of a reduction if we're talking about this. So it's 516 or so miles, 520 miles of range, depending on the model that you're getting. And the trim will affect this. Some trims are actually slightly higher on one side or the other. But when you look at a Hummer EV or the Hummer truck or SUV EV, the Lightning, the Rivian, all those sorts of vehicles, Tesla Model X, things like that, then you'll notice that the highway fuel economy numbers tend to be lower than the city ones. So this is part of my problem, I would say, with outlets that say, oh, you know, I, I towed with a Lightning and it only got 200 miles of range. That's a significant reduction over 320 miles. Well, 
Sure, but you were towing on the highway. So really what you did was you went from 280 miles of rated range down to 200 miles of range. This is not as big of a drop as you might think. Also, remember that the fuel economy tests by the government are done relatively slowly. So the highway city highway test cycle, rather, there's one test cycle that uses a high speed run, but the average speed is something like 60 miles an hour. And all of the other test cycles are very low speed. So aerodynamics plays a very minor role in those tests. Um, so it's, it's definitely going to require that people rethink the way they think about range. Yeah, I think in the future, um people are going to think more in terms of efficiency as we get further away from the fear of being stranded. Because other than like diesel enthusiasts, I hardly ever hear people talk about the range of their gas or petrochemical powered car. Uh, you know, maybe some Volkswagen diesel enthusiast is going on some sort of a hyper miling run. And he's just thrilled that he can go 600 miles between Phillips. Mm -hmm. But no one talks about gas powered cars that way, mostly because we know we can get gas anywhere. And I think as people find less trouble finding a high-speed charger, no matter where they are, you'll hear more about efficiency because people will just be judging cars based on how much they have to pay to yep. charge them, as opposed to this notion that I need my Lucid to go 500 miles in case I literally can't plug in. I think we will see that change just as we saw the change in gas-powered cars. We'll focus on efficiency. Yeah, it's possible. And I'm, I'm curious to see if we ever see much of a focus on idle efficiency. You know, if you're the kind of person that relatively rarely drives your EV and you buy a Rivian or a Tesla or some of the other startup companies that are designing their electronic systems in a very similar manner, then you may end up spending more on electricity over, say, a week or two than with an alternative like a Kia EV6 or a Bolt or a Ford Mach-E that uses very little when the vehicle is idle. It all depends on your situation and how, how much idle time your vehicle has. Um, for instance, the, the Kia EV6 goes into an incredibly deep sleep state, which for some folks might be useless because given enough time, the Kia vehicles turn off the cell modem even. And in order to actually recontact with the car and use any of the connected features, someone has to go start the car again, and then the cell modem will reconnect. The Ford products, they seem to keep the uh, cell modem alive a lot longer, and they'll go into a deeper sleep state where you have to lock or unlock the vehicle in order to refresh the data. So there's more of a polling interview, an interval rather, and maybe you have to wait 10 minutes or so for that data to come. But the Rivian and the Tesla product line, they're pretty much always connected. So that's really draining extra power. Yeah, I think realistically, this is where solar panels on cars will finally find mm -hmm. their niche. Whether Indeed. or not the era happens, having yeah. like one kilowatt worth of power per day from like a solar roof, especially once we get past the idea of glass roofs, which suck. Mm -hmm. Well, be one kilowatts one system. kilowatts a pretty hard ask but with the real estate on the average new car but That's you could right. definitely do you could definitely do maybe 400 watts or so uh, on the roof of a vehicle with a, a high efficiency solar panel and with the Rivian just about six hours of sunlight a day with a 400 watt panel would have pr practically solved its loss issues. I think that's where we're going on that front. By the way, for all of you out in cyberspace listening to this, if you're burned out on EVs, we're going to take a brief diversion to the world of cars no one wants to be seen driving. These cars <laughs> get worse with time. <laughs> Unlike your Tesla, which gets all sorts of over-the-air updates, I don't think anyone wants to be seen in a 1982 to 1988 Chrysler LeBaron. K-Car, Plastic Wood, George Costanza, uh, <laughs> apocryphally John Voight. Alex, what do you think are the most embarrassing like 80s through 2000s cars to be seen in today? I would probably go with a Lincoln Town Car. You see kind of a lot of them, especially the Cartier edition, uh, you know, with <laughs> the sagging rear end. Why They're always drooping in the back. Something has always gone wrong. And they're not, they don't look, not, nothing about that was good. It was a very bad era for Lincoln. I really don't understand how they sold as well as they did because every executive transport company yeah. had to have one and they were awful. Then they're awful now. I remember there was this poll of people working in finance in New York and they had this whole thing about cars, like what car do you want to be seen driving? What car to take the valet? What car to take on a date? The car to be seen drive, to be seen driven in, like ranked ahead of the S class and the seven series, it was the Lincoln town car. And I could never understand the mentality wow. there. That makes no sense. Wow. Yeah, no, I'd take the S class every day. <laughs> it gets worse though. I mean, let's face it. 
Lincoln Town Car or Lincoln Blackwood? I think I aim for the town car. I didn't mind the Blackwood. I think that was actually a car ahead of its time. I think that if they tried to give that a whirl today, that a luxury truck would work. I think that they were just a little, about 10 years too early, Cadillac and Lincoln both. It could it could have been good. I think it was fine at the time. They should try it again. Uh, well, I mean, <laughs> it had the, the front end was a navigator. The back end was a bed that didn't fully open. And I think that kind of sealed its fate. You have a fully covered bed uh, covered with paneled custom cut wood. Um, and I believe the wood was real, but you can't put anything in it. And I guess the back end of the truck turned out to be a coffin and the corpse was, you know, the Lincoln pickup, unfortunately, the whole idea of a Lincoln mm -hmm. pickup came back with the Mark LT, which doesn't have the dork factor to be sure, but I don't know. The Blackwood was funny because there was this, there was a McDonald's across from a Lincoln dealer. There was Lincoln Mercury back then in my town. And me and my friends, we'd go to that McDonald's after high school every day. And for two years, we looked across the street at that Blackwood and it didn't go anywhere. After two years, I got to assume they sold it at cost. It got so old that they had to start cleaning it to remove the signs of the seasons from the planks. Yeah. I'm going to be interested to see how Rivian goes in the it base effectively a luxury pickup truck space because it's starting MSRP is pretty high. The interior is definitely very nice. And if you can command eighty ninety thousand dollars for your Silverado, an F-150 or a Ram pickup truck, then why not have a luxury branded truck again? Uh, it seems sort of like a logical extension. I. I kind of think that Lincoln and Cadillac had unrealistic sales expectations for their vehicles. Just like some folks have unrealistic sales expectations for Jeeps, Wagoneer, and Grand Wagoneer. I've recently heard a few a few uh, PR people and a few um, uh, journalists, not, not Stellantis PR people, mind you, from the competition that were saying, oh, well, you know, that seems to be really stinking up the joint, the sales on the Wagoneer and Grand Wagoneer. And my answer was, uh, how do you figure it sells better than the Lincoln Navigator and it sells almost as well as an Escalade and it's priced more like the Escalade than the Navigator. So sounds like a success to me. <laughs> I mean, I will also say this, the dork factor is pretty high. If you have one of those old Escalades built on the Avalanche platform, yes. an old Escalade can still be kind of cool in, in kind of like a gangster way. But the old Avalanche based Escalade, that is up there with the Blackwood. Uh, things from the 2000s I wouldn't want to be seen driving today. Still going with the head of its time. I think it's okay. <laughs> Sticking with trucks and GM in this case, I guess we go from the, the Avalanche and the Escalade to the Hummer H2. I mean, I think a yellow Hummer H2 is probably the uncoolest truck to be seen driving today. Even I as the would... Hummer gets marked up used. I would be more more distressed to be seen in an H3 than the H2, but that's just me. Well, if the if the H two is yellow, unbeatably dumb, un unbleedable, un unbeatable the, dwarf factor. An SSR is worse. I would rather be seen in in the Hummer. Oh, sorry, the HHR, HR, whatever the heck that was. The SSR was the truck one. The SSR yeah. was the truck one. The 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 I don't want to be a PT cruiser. That one because the PT cruiser was cutesy, funky at the time, and the okay, Chevy was yeah. just the imitation. That was worse. Okay. Not that I would want to be seen in a PT cruiser either, especially a PT cruiser cabrio. Uh, but uh, but the Chevy was worse. Yeah, I would say second only to the Murano Cross Cabrio. The PT cruiser might be the most embarrassing convertible mm. of my lifetime. Um, yeah, apparently the Cross Cabrio's roof was was designed very badly at the beginning. It was a rush job. The company that Nissan selected to do the top wasn't really prepared. And according to the folks that I know at Nissan, the failure rate is basically 100%. They will all die shortly thereafter. Uh, you so don't ever buy one. Don't okay, buy so one it's used. A bad car too. <laughs> yeah, there's one. There's there's a a really pristine example in the Nissan Museum that apparently uh, you can drive around if you ask them very nicely enough, and you're you know a, one of the member of the press. Um, but I was told don't play with the roof. Don't move it. It has to be taken out when it's not going to rain. The roof should never be moved. <laughs> well, I, I think. I mean, that's that's actually kind of interesting. It, it humanizes the cross cabrio in a way that I never would have imagined. But I'm, I'm not going to take pot shots at the 01 to 05 Pontiac Aztec because that horse is dead. That horse is glue. Like, the process is complete. But from the 1990s, how about the Suzuki X90? That was bad. 
I I mean, if you're in Europe, I would I would say that the Fiat Multipla was uglier. Uh, well, I mean, without a doubt. But the, the X90 proved that Suzuki had no idea who bought the old Samurai <laughs> or why they bought it. <laughs> I mean, yes. this I mean, let's face it. This was like a body on frame, legitimate locking low range off roader. But it was built in the shape of a subcompact SUV coupe. I don't know where the thought process came from. Things like the Vitara and the Grand Vitara ultimately like picked up where the Samurai left off. But the chance of having like a second generation Samurai unslimed by rollover, um, you know, associations, <laughs> uh, it was lost with the XC90, which was just terminally weird and bizarrely could be purchased with two wheel drive. Yes. And I forgot that that's what they called it. I wonder if Volvo had any problems with their XC90. Yeah, well, XC90. There you go. Well, they built it long enough, so I'm guessing that worked out. Um, so, okay, X. the X90 was horrendous in concept. Although, perversely, if you had, like, a perfect one today with four-wheel drive, it might be worth something. In the same True. sense, that, like, the Ford Excursion, if you've got a perfect one, those are becoming collectible. Yeah, they were ugly. I never, I never, never could get into the excursion. It was just too strange looking. And for those of you who don't remember the excursion, uh, think of a expedition being based on an F-150. Now imagine a Ford Super Duty converted into an SUV. That's the excursion. Yep. The even bigger, crazier thing. Yeah, like 7,000 pounds of body on frame dinosaur from like the last few years when that was unabashedly cool. Um, mm -hmm. So I will also say this, I'm taking uh, out of the 1980s cars that we could slime, I'm taking the Yugo off the list for the same reason as the Aztec. It's just too easy. <laughs> but I'm adding the Mirkur XR4 Ti, oh, the yes. car. Yes, that was not a good era. I mean, there are a whole bunch of European made Fords with turbocharged engines that could have been so cool. That one was, that was not, not the one. No, no. no, no the not. bubble Taurus was pretty bad too. The Taurus was sailing high on sails, and then they redesigned it using only circular shapes, and none of that was good. Yeah, like people called the first generation car a jelly bean. Ford kind of reflected on that. They're like, "Oh, we'll give you a jelly bean. We'll yes. give you a jelly bean." I think that was the '96 Taurus. And if you're trying to get a visual picture, just well, imagine a jelly bean. So. The smart car and the Scion IQ, if you mention one, you have to mention both. What were they thinking for the US market? I had a strange soft spot for the Scion IQ. <laughs> it, was the, it was the more practical, more rational smart car. Because yeah, the smart, the smart, I actually had an order on a smart. Uh, and uh, and you, it, 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 it theoretically hit at the right time. You know, gas was expensive. Uh, the economy wasn't great. I thought, you know what? I could, I could commute in a smart, smart car. I could make this work. But the problem was it arrived and it wasn't cheap anymore. There was that Penske deal, as I recall, because like Mercedes was like only quasi involved in the inner workings of it. Initially, it was a really weird deal. But uh, it wasn't as cheap as people wanted. The fuel economy wasn't as high as people hoped because they were still trying to, you know, do translations from the European cycles. And they're like, ooh, it gets 40, 50 miles per gallon. No, it doesn't. That's not reality. It took premium. Uh, yeah, it took premium gas. Although, you know, it didn't need to because we fed all the press ones regular and that worked fine. Um, but there was no back seat. Uh, it, it was very underpowered, and the single clutch automated manual drove like a drunk 14 year old trying to learn how to drive a manual for the first time. It was bad. It was very, very bad. You'd be, you know, you're in one, you're lurch forward, you're in one gear, and then, you know, you're waiting for it to rev, and it finally hits the red line, and now all of a sudden you're not in any gear, and you're waiting for it, waiting for it, and then bang into the next gear. Everything about it was was bad. Um, the Cabrio was adorable, but not well priced. But the Scion IQ, it actually it it actually was was decent as far as fuel economy. It was much better than the Smart. It had a tiny back seat, which was you know usable if you needed to. Um, I fit back there in the rear. We actually had a, a I went to the launch event for that one once upon a very long time ago. Really tiny turning radius. We jammed four people in there and. 
it fit. It was not great, but you could do it. Um, and the fuel economy and reliability was significantly better. And it, of course, then there's the the novelty of the Signet, the Aston Martin oh, version right. of the Scion, um, where I have right seen there. third party bumper kits to turn your IQ into one. Okay, and for people out there in cyberspace who may have just blocked out this memory, uh, the Signet was an Aston Martin customized, rebodied, reinteriored Scion IQ because the world needed this. Mechanically, nothing changed, but inside mm -hmm. it was fully custom. You could get anything you want, contrasting piping, stitching, uh, butter soft hides, and the outside had a sort of David Brown grill type thing going mm -hmm. on. Uh, I but wish you could, but you could that. only buy it if you had an if you bought the Aston Martin. It was the dinghy. Yes, you, you had, exactly. Yeah, and this was the dinghy. Exactly. Um, but can you ever can you even like imagine I, the Signet? I almost get it. Like, okay, I can see that as like a lifestyle accessory if you already have an Aston Martin, not as a car, but as an accessory. That's fine. Yes. But what was Toyota's mentality that they saw the smart car and they're like, "What a coup! We need a response." I think it was the same deal. Gas prices were high. It was intrinsically less expensive to construct than a Prius. The fuel economy was good. And they thought, you know, there's there's a market for the smart car thing in cities, urban areas in the US. We should capitalize on this. We need one too. It, it, it seemed almost rational at the time, let's be honest. Whether or not it was a good idea in the end, at the time, it, it was it was rational. Okay, all of these have been easy. Now I'm gonna force you to make a judgment call because the argument can be made either way. The J Mays Retro T Bird, cool or uncool? No, not cool. Not cool. Is it because it's too retro or just because it was wrong for the market or just not a great drive? All of the above? Oh, it sounds about right. Yeah, probably, yeah. I mean, I, T tops are horrible. I mean, here's the thing about the retro bird. Like, retro, if you don't remember, retro could have been cool. There were times when retro was cool. A good example is like 2005 Ford Mustang, just enough. Mm -hmm. Bad examples are like the Chevy HHR, the SSR, the PT Cruiser, the retro T Bird. It's like where you've run out of ideas and you're like, I'm going to sell you something old, mm -hmm. poorly yeah. reimagined. And I'm going to play on your naivete. I'm, I'm going to play on your inability to s distinguish this from like an original idea. Like the I think Viper the problem cool. is the problem is you can do it and it can be cool, but then you but you can overdo it and it's not cool anymore. Like the I would argue that the PT Cruiser, the first PT Cruiser was cool. The okay. problem was it went too long and then Chevy tried to copy it. Both of those uncool. The later later PT Cruisers not cool, HHR not cool, etc. Um and they were playing it, it, but that was that was a tricky one because I think that they managed to pull it out because the Prowler was first and that yes. was the retro thing. That was cool. I so wanted a Prowler. They were like, aha, this worked. How about we make an accessible Prowler-like thing? And we created the PT Cruiser originally cool, uh, which was a squeak because it could have gone wrong. That could have been like, oh, that concept to this. No, we don't we don't like it. I, I would argue that it was cool. Um, but then Chevy, you know, played, they waited too long. They played they like, oh, let's copycat this. And it was so obviously a copycat is part of the problem. If it had come first, maybe it would have been okay. So obviously copycat. And then they had to like tag on again with the SSR. It's the, it's like being at the party with the guy who just heard the joke and then has to run around the party telling everybody the joke again and again and again and again and again until they're telling it to the first person. They're like, yeah. I, I was the one with the joke. Yeah, I can see that. The Viper was cool because it was a Cobra homage that didn't look like a Cobra, but it captured the spirit. Mm -hmm. the, the Prowler was cool because, although weirdly, it was like a tribute to the 1932 Ford Model 18. It was, granted, it's odd that Mopar did that, but it was cool as an idea. Mm -hmm. V6 aside, yeah. it looked cool. It looked the business. And I think once you start to translate that onto everyday cars and you start to iterate, uh, you quickly run out of ideas, and that's the yeah. joke that you told one too many times. Like it's like the Volkswagen Bug. They resurrected the Bug, and it was the new Bug, and it was cutesy. And then they kept trying to do it over and over again, and it, it just wasn't there anymore. Yeah, like as a brief run, being that it was already golf based and like last mm -hmm. generation golf, it yeah, cool. 
But you don't want something like that to get to the point where you have to kill it off. Leave people wanting a little bit mm -hmm. more. And, and that's sort of what happened with the best retro cards. Like today, you look at like, you know, a BMW Z8 and it's the coolest thing on earth. That straddled the line on the right mm -hmm. side of like retro. Like that's retro futurist. Then there's full blown J Maze retro. And I, I get the feeling that like J Maze, like today, is a more toxic brand than Chris Bangle, who given current BMW products, probably could is be. an apology. Yeah, it's like I I, I I think Chrysler could have squeaked out a second generation Prowler. There were concepts and it looked cool because it was a massaged variant of what we saw in the Prowler, only they fixed a lot of the weird bits. So it had a V8, it was rear wheel drive, real rear wheel drive. Because, you know, the, the Prowler, for those that don't remember the 1990s, the Prowler was what happens when the Skunk Works team's engineers, dudes, wanted to build their own thing using parts from the parts bin. So it had the engine and transmission from the Chrysler LHS and the New Yorker and the Concorde of the era, which were front wheel drive cars, only... This was the era where the platform was designed to theoretically accommodate rear wheel drive at some point in time. So step one was rotate the engine 90 degrees, rotate the transmission 90 degrees and do sort of a la early Audis where we have a longitudinal engine, but front wheel drive. So they had those bits already. So what they had to do was do a torque tube at engine speed from the front to the back. They tossed the transmission in the back, sort of like the AMG GT. Um, and that gave it actually kind of a, an, an endearing weight balance. It was about 50-50 weight balance, but no trunk at all. They had this huge hump in the rear because the suspension shock towers and all the construction going on back there and the transmission and everything else in the rear just ate up a lot of space. Um, so it had this, this sort of a pregnant beetle look in the rear with that, that big trunk lid. And uh, to solve that problem, if you bought your Prowler, they would sell you a matching Prowler trailer to no uh, solve the whole cargo problem that looked just like the truck on the Prowler, only, you know, had two little, two little wheels in the back. Uh, I wanted one so bad somehow. And uh, I got talked out of it in the end because it wasn't practical at all. And I ended up with a Chrysler LHS instead in 2000. I should have bought the Prowler. Yeah, I'll say this. The verdict on the Prowler, so cool at like cruise night at Dairy Queen, uncool at anything resembling a track day. Oh, yeah. Not a track car at yeah. all. It's it's oh. that that cool looking, you know, boulevard tour. It, it was great on winding mountain roads, etc. The ride was terrible. Um, it was bolted together yes. with very little suspension movement. <laughs> yes. Don't yes. drive it in the rain. <laughs> So, Although the tops are more reliable than the Nissan Cabriolet. Well, there you go. So if you have to, if you're choosing between the convertible to buy and it's between a Cross Cabrio and a Plymouth Prowler, we know this is a consumer centric podcast. We want to help the massive buyers who are going to run into this conundrum. Mm -hmm. um, okay, a car that's been in production almost since that Prowler went off the market. LX platform Chrysler products. We're going to talk a bit about superannuated cars because you just reviewed the Forerunner. We're going to get to that in a sec. Let's talk about the idea of these cars that stick around forever, mm -hmm. endlessly refined, but the same platform. Why does this happen? Does it serve the customer or the brand or both? I, it depends on how long how it works, how it all sorts out in the end. Uh, Chrysler, I would I would insert the the PR statement from Stellantis when they see this episode that according to Stellantis, the LX platform is over, and these are now LD or whatever the heck they're calling it now that this is a different platform. Uh, my problem with that statement is if you redesign a bolt and you redesign it over and over and over again, but it still mates to the nut, did you actually redesign the bolt or not? And that is the problem with the claim that this is not LX anymore. So much of it is so similar that some parts are actually interchangeable when it comes to suspension components. But the claim is it's not actually the same platform anymore. Um, however, Challenger and Charger sell incredibly well. Charger is the best-selling full-size sedan in the mainstream segment in the U.S. Challenger is very frequently the best-selling two-door. 
and there's no convertible. If we're talking about simply mainstream coupe, it is by far the best seller. The only way Camaro and, or actually, Camaro's actually at the bottom of the pile, so I forget about that one. The only way Mustang ever gets close to sales for the Challenger is when you include convertibles. And there are a lot of Mustang convertibles out there. Yeah, and fleets too. That, yes. that is the official rental car of Florida. It's true. So that's although, a the arm. Yeah, although Charger is oftentimes a fleet vehicle, uh, but Challenger, Challenger is usually not available at your local dollar. So now it's interesting to me because even the LD dates back to 2011. So they've got an excuse, but they don't really. Um, mm -hmm. A really great repackaging of W211, like Mercedes E-Class parts and W220 S-Class parts. Mm -hmm. it's an interesting car, but it's not unique in the sense that it's been going for a long time on one platform. It's probably the best known because it spawned well, three variants that are still in production. Mm -hmm, Rest mm -hmm. in peace, Dodge Magnum, as much as I would love to see that come back. Um, Honestly, they've, they've they've worked well because if you're for for that, it's a market specific thing. I would say if this was a mainstream midsize sedan, it wouldn't have worked. But as the the big sedan style forward rear wheel drive thing, they're they're lean. They lean hard on the muscle car thing. They lean hard on the V8s. There's not one V8. There's not two V8s. There are three V8s available in this thing. Uh, you can go from 360 horsepower all the way up to 810 horsepower, depending on the version. Actually, 850, right, for the Demon, depending on the version you're talking about and the year you're talking about. So the platform was very well adapted to those kinds of power levels. Uh, you can you can fit a big transmission in that transmission tunnel. It was designed for the Mercedes 5-speed, which is not a space-efficient transmission at all. So with that in mind, there's a lot of room there. The ZF high, the high torque ZF8 speeds, the most powerful yes. uh, handling power handling ZF8 speed that's used in the quad turbo V12 luxury sedans from Europe, that will fit in a Charger and a Challenger, which is the key to being able to do the crazy engines that they offer there. Um, and then the rear suspension and rear suspension mounting parts were designed for AMG models, essentially, for that, that functionality to work. Big body, big fenders, you know, big wheel wells allow you to put crazy wide rubber on the vehicle. And of course, since it's a muscle car, who cares about some tacky fender flares on the front now and then in the high performance models? Uh, it's just a, it's a very niche -y thing. Um, and I think it's good for customers. Yeah. Let, let's look. No one is falling into one of these by accident. Right. Like you can just sort of slosh along in the aimless flow of consumerism and find mm -hmm. yourself in a RAV4 or a CRV or a Corolla with no real commitment. Nobody buys a Challenger or a Charger by accident. So this yep. is fan service, first of all. Second, they have gotten better. Aside from the huge range of powertrains, uh, you sit in like a 2005, like Chrysler 300, and a modern day, you know, top trim Charger or Challenger, the interiors have gotten so much better since the platforms were mm -hmm. internally redesigned back in 2014. Materials are better. They're higher grade. They're assembled better. So these things have gotten better in mm -hmm. every way that you can see, touch, and sense. Yeah. The but they drive really well. I mean, yeah, even back, even in 2005, car. even the original Chrysler 300, it drove really well. The interior was terrible. You know, I, I had a 2000 LHS. The concept for the 300 came out. I was like, ooh, I want one of those. And then I sat in it, and the interior was dreadful. It was really bad. Um, the previous LH cars were five, ten steps above what, what had been wrought once Mercedes got on board and was in charge of interior design. Uh, Mercedes is the problem with with that part. But the benefit was that they gifted this old platform, which was totally serviceable and handles extraordinarily well. So lots of fun to drive. It, but that's that's really, you know, the key to entirety uh, uh, at Dodge. When you take a look at Durango sales, incredibly stable over the last decade. It's pretty old as well. Um, but it serves a niche and customers seek it out for specific things that they're interested in. If you want a V8 under your family three row, or you want a 475 horsepower V8 or a 700 horsepower V8, it's the one to get. Now, I see an interesting pattern emerging here, because if you look at all of these vehicles that live on maybe too long, almost all of them are enthusiast oriented. So we just mm -hmm. saw in 2019, the end of the Maserati Gran Turismo, the Mercedes G-Class is soldiered on on bones that are ancient forever. 
the mm -hmm. Jaguar F type's been around since 2013. We've got the LX or LD series uh, Mopars, which are all basically enthusiast cars at this point. Mm -hmm. And then we've got a car that you just recently tested, which is the Toyota the Toyota Four Runner, uh, basically Japan's best U.S. market answer to something like a Wrangler Unlimited, and that still sells yeah. really well. But again, to like a niche kind of buyer, not the Rav Four buyer, well, not the Highlander guy. But what I think is interesting about the Forerunner is that its success with enthusiasts have managed to push it into a broader market, which is unexpected because there are not 240,000 enthusiasts for a Forerunner out there. We're talking yeah. about sales near a quarter of a million. So it is selling to RAV4 shoppers, CRV shoppers that are stumbling into a Forerunner and there's, oh, maybe, maybe a Forerunner is right for me, but it is positively ancient. This generation dates back to 2009, and this generation was a bare refresh of the bones that dates back to 2003. So this yeah. is older by far than the uh, the LH and uh, sorry LX platform vehicles over at at Stellantis, um, and it has not had the same sort of refreshing that we see in in the uh, the uh, the Charger Challenger 300 etc. Over that time. It still has the bug eye tail lamps that we found in, and bug eye headlamps that we found in Toyota's for quite some time. The tail lamps still have that silvery theme going on inside that was very Toyota retro from 10 years ago. Um, the interior has been very mildly touched here and there. The, the bumper has been tweaked a bit here and there. But uh, Toyota is definitely selling it on the rise in off-road oriented vehicles. So the rise of Wrangler has helped the rise of Forerunner, as Bronco. as has the rise of Bronco, etc. And you know, all these manufacturers have off-roady trims of their pickups and and things like that. That's all tying into that same rise that that's pulling up Forerunner. Uh, but it is really a, a weird niche vehicle for Toyota because it, it sells in volumes they wish the Tundra could sell in or Sequoia, um, but just just don't. And and it's the only body on frame vehicle in that category left also, which is weird. Um, yeah, if you're, well, I mean, and back, I, yeah, back, back when it was designed, I mean, we had the GMT 360 vehicles from GM. We had seven of them body on frame things with a solid axle in the back, independent suspension up front. And now this is the only one left. And I think it's important just to note that if you look across the board, like Alex said, there are too many of these selling to only be going to like off-road rats who want to just mod them out like it's definitely a combination of them people who want to look like them and people who used to once upon a time load up their sequoias and land cruisers and i think we've got some mm -hmm. overflow from that old crowd uh, possibly even people who like the idea of a defender but don't want to buy an old unreliable and overpriced car yeah, and I mean, uh, reliability is definitely a big thing for the Forerunner. I would say, you know, it's it's clung on to its ancient yeah. V six engine, its old five speed automatic transmission. Even when Tacoma has become more modern, Forerunner has stuck with the old old designs. And for some folks, that's a feature, not a bug. And I know you and I disagree on this, but I think that if the old Forerunner based FJ Cruiser were still in production today. Like they could sell that as the rival to your two door Broncos and Wranglers, and they could sell the four door Forerunner as like your Wrangler Unlimited four door Bronco rival. I feel like the FJ died too soon, especially since yeah. all the running gear, electrical architecture, and chassis are still in production. I'm glad they stuck a fork in it because the FJ was awful. I hated it off road, I hated it on road. It was too big, it was dreadful inside. The suicide doors were bad. It did look cool. I will agree the exterior looked cool. And if they could have just given us a rational, practical, narrower FJ, it would have made sense. The FJ was really wide. Um, was. That was my big problem with it on a trail. Because I think FJ was trying to chase Hummer more than Wrangler. Um, Wrangler is considerably smaller and considerably yeah. more nimble than FJ. If you take your FJ to an off-road park in the mountains, anything that's winding, it is a it is a bear to drive around because it is just so big. Yeah, it was shaped like a cube and a large cube at that. Mm -hmm. You are right that when the FJ was conceived, they were shooting more for the Hummer H3 customer than for the Wrangler customer. But still, you talk about it being 
hard to drive, hard to see out of, hard to get into, a mediocre dynamic experience, and like you just described a Wrangler. I still think there'd be a market for this thing if yeah, it were on the market today, unchanged. Yeah, I think the I think the problem with the FJ and the benefit to the Wrangler was Wrangler has decades and decades of history, very American very specific American history. Yes. It also has that real off-road ability. You know, it has solid axles. It's got the locker up front available, et cetera. So when, when people think Wrangler, they're thinking Wrangler Rubicon. And there is still very little in the market that is like a Wrangler Rubicon. It's not a Bronco because from the factory, the Rubicon can go places a Bronco simply cannot. Um, the lack of, of a solid axle is a bit of a problem off-road for Bronco. But the reason I would buy a Bronco over a Wrangler is because it's better on road. The Bronco's just better because Ford is more rational and says, you know, nobody goes off road in these things. Uh, yeah, sure, some people do, but you know, the Wrangler did not go from twenty thousand sales a year to a quarter million sales a year or more, depending on the year, because we built that many more off-road parks in America. It That's got right. there because they added a set of doors and people started buying it instead of a Rav Four. It, that, that is true. The Wrangler Unlimited was kind of a breakthrough product because A, it made the Wrangler more practical, and B, it brought back all the people who would have bought the old XJ Cherokee when that was still in the lineup. Mm -hmm. yep. So Jeep managed to bring back a whole bunch of customers who were basically ready to bail on the brand after the Jeep Liberty. Yep. I can see that. I can see and, that. And rationally, people want more room and they don't really take their, their vehicles as off-road as they think which is why the last time I had a Wrangler Unlimited, I suddenly realized it was bigger and has a longer wheelbase than my 2000 Grand Cherokee. Mm, actually, it's wider, yeah. wider, longer with a nearly 10 inch longer wheelbase. I think a two door Wrangler at this point is probably heavier than an old like ZJ first generation Grand Cherokee. Unit body, compact. I think that's like a $3,500 pound vehicle. I think, yeah, the, the Wrangler is like the size that the Defender was in the early 90s. Okay, we approach the end of our podcast today. We've got a whole lot of topics to broach on the next episode. Alex, how can people find us on the web? So head over to alexandautos.com. You can find us on YouTube and Alex on Autos, as well as the EV Buyer's Guide. There's the Instagram, the Twitter, the Facebook, etc. Find us on all those channels. And of course, you can find the video part of this podcast over on the Auto Buyer's Guide podcast YouTube channel. Ciao.